I'm requesting the students to kindly be seated. Um, किशोर सर आप बैठ जाइए हम अगला सेशन शुरू करने वाले हैं
Penny. Uh, okay, all those who are buzzing there with absolutely exciting things to talk about, could you please take your seat? We are starting in about 30 seconds. Uh, ADW volunteers, you're doing a phenomenal job. You could just continue and make sure if the students are seated. Thank you so much. Uh, so for all those who are there, um, we are starting with the second session, day two, Ahmedabad Design Week. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the next speaker, Major General M. Indrabalan, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, could we please hear it for Indra Balan, sir? Vivek ji, is he there with you? I request all of you to not crowd near the door. Sorry, just give us a minute. So ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for, as they say, Major Sahab. Major General M. Indra Balan, Additional Director, General NCC Bihar and Jharkhand. Ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Major, thank you for being so patient. We're trying to manage time. So we're looking forward to an amazing session. I request uh, Vivek from UID to kindly felicitate Major Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Vivek Karmokar, sir. Avina Anna Stoll. Thank you so much, Vivek. A quick introduction, Major General Indir Balan was commissioned into the Indian Army in 1986. He holds a BSc, BTEC, MSc, MBA and MPhil degree and is currently pursuing his PhD in Youth Development from NID Patna. That's amazing. I mean, after a certain age, most of us have given up on academics, but it's nice to see him pursue his PhD. An alumni of Kendra Vidyalaya National Defense Academy at IIT Kharagpur. He is an ardent sportsman, adventure lover, and a member of Around the World Yacht Sailing Expedition in 1989. So without further delay, here is to the dynamic man. I invite Major General Indra Balan to kindly address the audience. Uh, while I request uh, Parth to play the introduction video. Kemcho Gujarat. To be here today on this very special academic design environment for a battle hardened soldier is a great privilege. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Members of the faculty, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, if you here, the President, the students of Karnavati University, and all the friends, brothers, the youth, sisters, and each one of you who's present in this hall. Wishing you all 
an amazing day and an amazing life ahead. You know, in the army, uh, we are a little stiff-necked. And yesterday you heard Kakkar, Prahlad Kakkar. He said that uh, I have a military spine. Now, usually people say, those who are third generation military people, they say, I have, you know, OG blood flowing in my veins. But he said, I have an OG spine. Now, what's the difference? When you say I have an OG blood, you're talking of patriotism. When you're talking of OG spine, you're taking patriotism to the level that you can defeat the enemy and lay down the sacrifice that is deserving of you, expected of you. So that's where the spine comes in. Why I'm referring to this is because the military way of life is very different. And it's also a paradox that I'm going to address an audience which I won't say is diametrically different, but is very diversified from the military environment. And that's my challenge today, how to connect with this audience, which we all know as Generation X. Uh, are all of you Generation X? Just raise your hands. I'm only addressing the people behind. Is anyone who's Generation Y here? All of you Generation X? OK, great. So the Generation X is you know, a different cup of tea. I, as ADG of Bihar and Jharkhand, I deal with youth a lot. When I did my MBA in IIT Kharagpur, I was dealing with young minds like you who were doing MBA with me. And I, that's when I realized that dealing with the young lot takes a different cup of tea. And fortunately, I have had this exposure, and I hope I'm able to connect with you and convey what I'm trying to say today. Yeah. Can we have the presentation on? Well, gentlemen, so this was the topic which I was given to by the Honorable Vice Chancellor. Because when he invited me, though I, I, did, I do have a lot of domain knowledge on developing innovation, technology, etc., but my present appointment does not allow me to talk much about what the military needs are. I'm sure there are other speakers who are covering it. But I'm more about inspiring into innovation and design. So my first exposure to the military innovation, way back in 2001, the militancy was its peak in Kashmir. We were losing numerous lives because of one thing known as the RCIED, Remote Controlled IED, operating on the VHF band, 118 to 136 megahertz and was playing merry hell with the civilian life, with the movement of convoys, with the movement of military personnel, and with our operations. And there was no solution. There was no solution even with the bigger powers, the bigger military powers, because this was something unique. And we had to work out something. What did we do? We managed to capture a number of these RCIDs, remote control IDs, fortunately in a cache in one of the operations. And then we had about 30, 40 of them. We started reverse engineering, understanding what it is. It was a radio chip which controlled the explosive. The point was when the explosive will go off, at what point in time. And how do you control it? How do you code it? There were no crypto mechanisms those days. So they were using simple VHF you know, radio frequency, which is easily uh, interceptable. And what they did, when we saw every you know, bit of uh, ID had 10 digits embossed on it. And we kept wondering, each 10 digit was different from the other. And we couldn't figure out what it was. So we put through a lot of our innovative minds, whatever we could get hold of, with the people from the signals branch and others. And finally, fig we figured out the 10 digit was nothing, but the frequency mentioned in six digits in the last, and the first four digits talking about the code which activates it. Now we had the secret. What do you do next? How to stop this? And that's where the innovation came in. We tried to find solutions, which is not available in the industry, because then we didn't have the advantage of people like you to listening to me. One and two, we were not allowed to talk to the others. So we had to do something in-house. And what was that? We reverse engineered the whole thing, and we had to find a counter to this. 
The way we found a counter was something innovative design. We managed to get hold of VHF uh, transmitters, put them all together, and did what is called as the barrage frequency jamming. That's the first step. After barrage frequency jamming, we moved on to the next step. As to sending these codes, the DTMF codes, through these frequencies in a sequential manner, running almost at the speed of you know, 100 codes in uh, maybe 30 seconds. That was the best speed we could achieve. Today, I'm, I'm sure you can do 1,000 codes in half a second. Mo world has moved on. But that's what best we could achieve then. And run these codes in a sequential manner, and we had to run some millions of codes over the period of one hour, so that when you run these codes over the DTMF uh, signal, whatever IDs were planted in the morning would get detonated if it figured in this code. We were not sure if you would achieve success because this was like uh, a dream. But it took us one plus year to know that this was getting successful. Because gradually, the remote control IDs operating on the VKHF frequency started vanishing from the scene. And two more incidents happened. The remote control IDs went off when the militants were planting it because this remote control RCID, the counter mechanism, was detonating it as it was being set and put to activation. Now that, I felt, was an innovation. And so innovation is something that is here in the mind. And why I'm trying to refer to all this is to say that is what is my scope of today's lecture. We know Abdul Kalam the father of India's scientific discovery and DRDO. The changing landscape, what's coming up? I just spoke about Taurus. That's the RCID equipment. The Generation Z, whom I'm probably addressing today. We have our IT defense innovation cell. And a few other things I'll try to talk about, the risk profile matrix, Bloom's taxonomy, comfort zone map, and the defense design essentials, and what the NCC can do for you. Well. The Generation Z is a dread of the military. You are very different. And the reason I wore a t-shirt today and not formally dressed the way I am is hoping that I'll be able to connect with you because that's what you people wear. All right. But that apart, so what is it? Does anyone disagree with what I'm saying? Probably I can add metaverse and uh, cryptocurrencies here, right? Well, so if this is what it is, and this is exactly what we don't need in the military. So we're staying on the opposite sides. But how do we connect? There's a shazam here. How do we close this shazam? And if you can close this shazam, I think we can create a wonderful world. Well, the good part is the same generation has some outstanding characters and qualities. And that's what is my hope. And that's what I feel will make all the difference in the coming years. They are tech savvy, no doubt about it. They are proactive in what they want to do. They are not in a reactive mode. They are not waiting for things to happen. They want to make things happen. They are mentally agile, adaptive to change, not like us who are bedded in wherever we are. They challenge status quo, the best thing to do. They are team-oriented, multitaskers, impatient, and they are adventurous. Adventure in every way. Uh, adventure came into me, sir. I think in the introduction it was mentioned that I, I went, I had an opportunity to go sail around the world in just a sailing boat. It had no engine. It had just sails and six of us sail, sailed around the world in 1989. Now that adventure is extreme adventure. But this adventure helps you to try out things. Now what Stanford UST PhD research paper said about innovation and design? I like this particular paragraph. Please go through. I kept wondering, what is the difference between innovation and design? Are they the same? Are they different? Are they together? Can they be divorced? Or is innovation leading to design, or is design leading to innovation? I don't think we have very many answers. There are very senior professors here who probably agree with me that it's very difficult to you know, differentiate between the two. But this is something which sums up. How do you use a pointer in this? Can someone help you with the pointer? Okay. 
So what is important here? This line, that they are divergent thinkers who are also observant, ingenious, confident, and persistent. Apart from the fact they are, they are risk takers, they are the characteristics of designers as creative professionals. So what's the risk profile? Indians, just a few years back, were known to have figured in the first quadrant, the risk averse. I come from Kerala, where all our parents teach us not to take risks. It's a different thing that I joined the armed forces. But even there, I'm taught avoid risks. We risk, avoid risk with money, we avoid risks everywhere. But that's not true. That's actually not true. Indians are big risk takers. The point is, whether you figure in the risk taker quadrant, or you figure in the risk manager quadrant, or you figure in the risk lover quadrant. So a simple example. The motorcycle, when you want to drive it first, it looks like a very risky proposition. Your mother would never want you to drive. But then you go and somehow spend time with your friends or some peer group and somehow try to learn it, and that's when you become the risk taker. So you've taken the risk to drive something which is risky. And then what happens? Then one fine day, your mother notices you driving. And instead of admonishing you, starts admiring you and says, Mom, better, can you take me on the pillion? Then you become a risk manager. Why? Because by then you have learned to drive this mobile in such a manner that you are, can manage the risk associated with accidents, with driving, with whatever. So that's a good risk manager. So you go to the next level. But then instead of mother, when you make your girlfriend sit behind, you go to the last quadrant. That's when you become a risk lover, right? So don't do that. Remain in the mismanager quadrant. OK. So what are the essential features of military design? I'm sure there are many features in design which your uh, you know, eminent professors are teaching you here. But I'm going to just bring you the four things that you need to remember when you design for the military, when you design for the armed forces. I'm not sure if there are people already here who are designing for the armed forces. I'm sure, I'm told that the class is yet to begin. But I'm just leaving this behind, that if you want your designs to succeed with the military, please use military-grade material, which can withstand the heat, which can withstand the temperatures, which can withstand dust and whatnot. It should be combat hardened. It should be able to survive under shelling conditions, when a soldier rolls over, falls over a cliff, and yet he needs to operate that. So it should be combat hardened. Definitely needs to be innovative. That's the only way you can achieve the other features, as innovative as it can be. That's the hallmark. And it needs to be soldier friendly. Because your soldiers are not the tech savvy people that you all are. He's a simple groundsman. He comes from the uh, farming background, majority of them. They are simple soldiers, so they want simple gizmos, not the complex ones you all are used to. So that's where it comes soldier friendly. And Jugard, many of us use this word, Jugard is innovation. For me, no, sorry, I don't agree with that. Jugard is Jugard, just make shift. And in, in military innovation, Jugard won't work because of the last line. There are no runners up in a war. You can have a runner up in cross country, you can have a runner up in football, basketball, but in war, You've either done it or you've lost it. So there is no scope of Jugard here. The innovation better work. You can't fail a soldier. And that's where the indigenization is important. You heard the president of Ukraine yesterday. I'm sure all of you are following it. What did he say? He was offered an exit from the country. What did he say? Anyone? Yep. There you are. Give me a big hand, gentlemen. He said, I want ammunition. Don't send me off this country. I want to be with my people. He doesn't have ammunition to fight, even though he knows that it's, not a, it's a fight against David and Goliath. But he still wants to fight. And he's not able to fight because he doesn't have ammunition. And that's where indigenization comes in. We need to have the military stuff produced in India so that our soldiers don't have to look back across the shores. Well, what is the difference now? The biggest thing that's happening is that I'm standing in front of you. 
as a serving officer. It never happened in the past. That's the difference. There was a huge chasm between the military and the academy and the private sector. There was no way you could interact with us except on a friendly tone. Definitely not professionally. Definitely not for, definitely not for buying equipment except those who were following the processes. But this is changing and changing for good. And this is what is going to make a difference. And I, and I must compliment Karnavati University for having taken up and brought military people here to directly interact with you. My compliments to the university, the chairman, everybody, and all of you. So when you develop military technology, what you need is not merely addressing military use cases. Because at the end of the day, while the Indian Army is one of the largest armies in the world, it has the largest procurement needs, but still there's a limit to how much military can buy. And therefore, it will be smart if you can do what is called as a dual-use innovation, dual-use design, and dual-use technology. And in your own area, the biggest thing that you need to drive, apart from the fact that you have a design support system, product development team, but it is innovation which will help you to reach into the Indian Army. And this I'm repeating time and again. Just a few slides which I thought many of you may have missed. I happened to attend this webinar just two days back. And these are not my slides. These are slides of the Ministry of Defense. I'm just flashing it for you to go through to tell you what is the changing landscape, what is coming in, and why there is very bright future for the entire lot who's getting into the military technology, innovation, and design. This is what it says. It says this also. What the region poll is doing. That's more relevant to you. Imagine the number of startups which are being addressed by the IDEX. And these are figures quoted by the Ministry of Defense. And this is specifically for the people who want to enter into military design. Well, this is one of the topics I'm interested in being in. Uh, I won't say educationist, but I have some interest in education. And uh, I'm sure you are uh, illustrious professors are all aware of what I'm going to talk about. But there's something different I want to mention to the lot who's sitting here. So all of you are, all of you are aware of this Bloom's taxonomy? Just raise your hands, the people in the, in the back. Yeah, I'm sure the front runners would be aware of. Those at the back? Okay, so very few, right. Okay, then I, I'll just take half a second to half a minute to explain this. So what is Bloom's taxonomy? Benjamin Bloom in 1956 laid down the learning objectives that a learning institution needs to have when they are teaching students. And this was way back in 1956. And this is something which says that a university or a college or a school is a repository of knowledge. They provide knowledge to students. And they were the only people who could provide knowledge. It wasn't aware anywhere else, except you had a friend who was very knowledgeable. But primarily you had to go there. And then they had to ensure that there is understanding, translation, summarizing in terms of comprehension is the job of the teachers. And then those who did this take them to the next level of application of what you have comprehended, and thereafter we have the ability to analyze it, synthesize the information, and finally do the evaluation. It ended there with evaluation. Can you imagine? Some bit of synthesis was there. And this was the primary goals of education for a very long time, which India too adopted, till very recently. Then what happened? In 2001, this changed. Gentlemen called Anderson and Carthwall, they reinvented it. They said, listen, just reaching the stage of evaluation, synthesis is not enough. There's more to it. So they changed, brought the evaluation down, and removed this knowledge out. Why this knowledge was removed out? It's because now the universities and colleges are no more repositories of knowledge, no more the only repositories of knowledge. Today, knowledge or information, let's say, let's call it information or knowledge, information is available, galore, everywhere. 
So the role of the universities in storing and being the repository has changed. It has a much bigger and much more responsible job to perform. The job of a teacher today is far more difficult than what it was some time back. Because it has to help the students climb this ladder rather than just giving information. And that's a far more difficult job. And what is at the pinnacle of learning is creativity. That's where all of you come from. So if you're all here, it's because you're at the pinnacle of learning. But this pyramid is reducing in size. And as you see, the people who are reaching the creativity is a very pyramidal, steep pyramid, handful reach in the higher education. That is what needs to change. And then what did someone do? They inverted this. Now, this is what I want to share with you. What is this inverted pyramid? Beth Levis and Ravina Inam from the Kanthwan Polytechnic University. They said, why do we have a situation where the handful few people reach the level of creativity? Why can't we have an education system which helps more of you? All of you are selected lot coming from, I believe, the whole country. There are people from Maharashtra, Gujarat, Bombay, uh, Kerala, possibly everywhere. And you are the handful picked lot. But if you really see in a college how many reach on top, it's that handful few who reach the level of being able to create either a venture or a product or a design or an artwork or whatever. Handful few. Why can't we have more of them doing this? And this is what I said is the challenge in front of the professors today. How to create students and more number of students who are in this field. So this is just an example of how Bloom's taxonomy in the new version works in the digital industry, in the digital world. I'll just leave this slide behind for you. Uh, someone can stop me if I'm running out of time. So how someone who's uh, identifying, starts with the ability to identify a legitimate search engine, ends up with someone who can launch and produce their own podcast. This is a simple example of reaching the different levels of learning. Is it structured? Are we doing structured method of helping people reach this level? Or is it happening by default? Or is it happening by just because you're there? This is something that we all need to look into. And I'm going to leave this decision tree behind by the Deloitte University Press, which gives out a very good roadmap on how to structure students or how to structure your curriculum in order to make your students or your institution design enablers. If you follow this flow chart, you won't be going very wrong. You do positive time, I'm, I'm not going to go through this, but I'm sure uh, some of you read it, it's quite self-explanatory, but it's very well done. What did the Economic Forum 2016 say? What is going to be the top skills for future job creation, the employers and the employees both? Complex problem solving. Critical thinking. Yesterday I was having a discussion with the Vice Chancellor on this itself. People management, soft skills, emotional intelligence, soft skills, decision making, team leader. And all these and many more are there, but these are identified as critical soft skills for you to be successful. So that's where my organization comes in. I'm also selling my organization here. Okay, that's where I come from. How do NCC cadets? How many of you have heard of NCC? Raise your hands, please. The backbenchers. Oh, great. That's a good lot. That's a good lot, right. So the National Cadet Corps is not about just parading. I'm sure you see a lot of cadets march past and the RD parade and Prime Minister honoring them and you know all those things. That's what you usually see. But I'm going to show you some glimpses of what the National Cadet Corps does over and above parading on Rajpath. This is what they do. They are exposed to the combat. They physically are allowed to go and ride a tank, see how it functions, they go and fire bullets. They, here they're firing a ATGM. They go on attachment camps and train like the military. Why I'm showing you this? Because yesterday, the chief army staff made one mention. And that's when I added these slides. He said that before you design for the military, 
become one, at least mentally. Only then your designs will be useful to the military. And how do you become one? You can't. It's very difficult because you have your classes to attend, you have your uh, routines to follow, and plus you can't give full time there. So the way to partially do it is use this methodology. And what I'm showing you here are models. Well, we have amongst us today someone who vouches for his NCC days, for what made him today what he is. May I request Leo Peter to please stand up and just share his experience of his NCC days. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I am an alumni of one Karnataka Air Squadron 2008 batch. Luckily, uh, I am in this space because I started aero modeling when I was an NCC cadet. And the first time I ever flew an aircraft, so a lot of you might not know, 40 hours of flying is free in the NCC. So if you join an air squadron, there are a lot of NCC air squadrons across the country. You get to fly an aircraft which otherwise would cost you lakhs. But apart from that, uh, the exposure that you get at the NCC is what steals you in life. So if you're doing parade and you faint, they will make you sit for some time and then they will not say, do you want to go home? They will ask, when can you join back into the parade, right? So life's not fair like that and that's uh, where NCC makes you strong. And the exposure you get uh, to the armed forces and armed forces way of life is also what creates closeness to them. And the easiest way then to get connected to the armed forces is through your commanding officer at uh, the NCC. And I've also had the opportunity of training cadets in aero modeling at my uh, battalion uh, after I graduated. And today I am here in the drone space is because it all started way back in 2008 when I started building models at NCC for control line flying and RC flying. So that's, that's, that's why I always say everybody has to go through NCC and that way we would have more creators, more innovators and more entrepreneurs uh, who've already, uh, whose character is already built to face challenges and to build solutions uh, for the country. So that's my bit. So that's a true NCC credit speaking. And just by coincidence, I met him here. And by another coincidence, just this morning, I met the person who just honored me, Mr. Vivek. Is he here? Dr. Vivek. Yeah, thank you. He is all, uh, yeah, please come, sir. He, he is also an ex-NCC cadet and possibly one of the best designers you have. Please sit, listen in to him. <laughs> sir, come over. Well, just like Peter mentioned, it all started. I'm a cadet, 1980. And um, having those three years, and later on in college, another two years of NSS, that put me into the stream of very different, I would say, like you said, how do you match creativity with, with this? But it happened with me, making models. Uh, I was in the naval wing. So, making models of ships, and that put me into the stream of uh, going into sculpture when I went into college, uh, and not choosing any other stream. Um, which again gave me the opportunity to, to build the tableau for um, Bachindripal when she went into the Everest uh, for 26 January. Um, this was 1984. Um, yes, and we were just sharing all this. In fact, I uh, always felt that why not NCC may be made compulsory for schools and colleges and a one-year army training 
after undergraduate or during wow. our undergraduate. So well said. So well, ladies and gentlemen, that's what the NCC does for you. It puts in creativity, it gives you modeling skills, it helps you build solutions, it helps you face problems, it helps build what is inherently known as problem solving and critical thinking skills. Because when you put through a camp where nothing is in your favor, and you spend those 10 days there, going through the rigmarole of what happens there, and yet produce all these what Mr. Vivek just said and what Leo just said, it brings in the real creativity in you. And that's what I say that the NCC does with all this. And here's more. This gentleman and ladies is the highest battlefield of the world. And when you innovate and design something that needs to survive here, it is a different ball game altogether. Never seen extremes of climate, temperature, conditions. So when I said, what are the five features a military design must have? This is one of those. And this beats everything. Well, so if you all are ready for this, then you need to get out of your comfort zone. And it's a beautiful comfort zone exit map, which is simple to follow. But if you follow methodically, many of us, I was a young boy like you some time back, and I was in this comfort zone, feel safe and in control, and your mother's safety. But you've got to get out of that. And how do you get out of that? From comfort zone, you have to enter the fear zone, which is what many of us go through when we are youth, and then to the learning zone and finally the growth zone. And this applies to entrepreneurs, it applies to everybody. There's a good way of achieving that. So I'll close with a few inspiring quotes about creativity, design, and innovation. What did Michael Dell say? Don't fear, experiment like crazy. What did the chairman of Ad Adventure Holdings say? Don't just innovate for the sake of innovation. Go for solving problems. Another CEO of Ubing Gaming Company, let go of ideas. Let it be crazy, as, much, as crazy as it want. As long as you know what goal you want to achieve. There are no bad ideas. What did Jeff Bezos say about India? 21st century will belong to India. The dynamism, the energy, self-improvement, and the growth here is palpable. And that's what I see among the youth who are sitting in front of me. And the greatest scientist of all, the Albert Einstein, what did he say? And this is what I want to leave behind with you, because this is what we advocate in NCC. That most people say it is the intellect which makes a great scientist. Yes, you definitely need intellect. There are a lot of people with intellect. But what makes a great scientist is character. And what is character? It's about integrity, professional integrity. And what do you do? There's something very underlying. And we can't close these quotes without referring to our own father of innovation and scientific discovery. What did he say? Creativity is seeing the same thing, but thinking differently. And his best line is what I like here. And that's where I have hope on those, those last benches who are sitting there. They're the ones who will make all the difference. And they make all the difference always. Well, that's all for today. Jai Garvi Gujarat. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, uh, Indra Balan, sir. Especially for us teachers to uh, pin some hope on the backbenchers. Uh, since that's one thing we are always apprehensive about in the backbenchers. I'd like to invite uh, Shweta Trivedi ji, Assistant Professor, to kindly deliver the word of thanks. We are, uh, uh, is, uh, yeah, uh, and we have an uh, added speaker as well, so, but can they reach out to you somewhere, sir? On, uh, are you there on the social media? Okay, awesome, thank you, Shweta.
Good afternoon, everyone. I take this opportunity to thank Major General M. Indra Balan, ADG NCC Bihar and Jharkhand for such an electrifying session. Despite the vast gap, the current Gen Z and the extremely accomplished officers like yourself, you've shown us the route to become not only risk takers, but also risk managers and risk lovers. Thank you for sharing with us your experiences of on-field innovation, design, solutions, and re-emphasizing the need for indigenization. Thank you, Mr. Leo and Mr. Vivek Karmukar for sharing your NCC experiences. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Shweta, ma'am. Uh, with this, we come to the end of our session, sir. Thanks a lot. If Team ADW could help clear the table, we're good to start with the next session immediately. Do not leave, students. We're good to start in about a few minutes. Uh, Team ADW, volunteers, could you kindly help uh, clear up the stage? The next session, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be with Harsha Kikari, CEO, Holo Suite. Please allow us a little bit of a time because he needs to check uh, his PPT. There's going to be a small tech check. Do bear with us. Volunteers, ADW, do the do. Please make sure the students do not abscond. Check. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is amazing because the speaker is already trying to work on the uh, tech. So we're going to just 
delved straight into the session. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the next speaker, Harsha Kikiri, who is the CEO of Holo Suite. And uh, I just got a glimpse of the PPT, and it looks like it's going to be one amazing presentation. So without further delay, I request Dr. Raju Shanmugam, Professor and Dean USCI, to kindly welcome Harsha, sir, with a stole and the wiener. Ladies and gentlemen, let's clap for Harsha, sir. Thank you, Dr. Raju. Uh, can we please have the introduction video, Parth? Asha, sir, take it away, all yours. If there's a technical glitch in the middle, we have two people there. Let us know. Thank you. Hello? Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Awesome. So, uh, can we have the video presentation, please? Okay, excellent. So, I, I think all of you now have heard from... Uh, Wing Commander, how beautiful it is to be in NCC. Wouldn't you all want to be in NCC? Wouldn't you want to go to those mountains? Wouldn't you want to kind of learn flying? Wouldn't you want to do some beautiful aircrafts? Wouldn't you want to go underwater? I, when I was a kid, I wanted to do all those things. But there were only two problems that I had. One was problem of cost. It was just too expensive. I couldn't afford to do all of things. The other was the problem of time. And the problem of time was also related to the problem of space. Because if I was in one place, it took me so much time to go to the other place, to go to the Himalayas, to go to the Antarctica, to go under the water. And then the other thing is many of these things are also very dangerous. Right? So, in fact, in defense, one of the biggest things they do is called training. Right? Most of the time, if you see, army is not fighting wars. Yesterday also, I think, uh, uh, Jaswal sir, uh, Lieutenant General sir, basically told how, because they were not fighting wars, they were being told to dig ditches and do other things, like do civil work. Right? That is not what they should be doing. What they should be doing is actually training, training for the war, simulating, creating enemies. And how do we do this thing? And why are we not doing it? One, there is a huge cost. The cost of training. Imagine if you had a submarine and you wanted to train everybody on the submarine just to get everybody to where the submarine is, get them inside or even get the submarine parts to show them to imagine the Raphaels, it's like 500,000 crores or something. I don't even know how much it is. Some crazy amount of money we have spent on those 32 Raphaels. Imagine how many people will be able to go and learn in that, right? How do we solve this problem of time and space? That is where Metaverse comes in. So we have already solved it for the Indian Army. And one very, very good news that I wanted to share with you, which just I got yesterday, is the solution that I am showing here, which was first deployed, tested, verified, user trials approved, and inducted into the Indian Army. Now, Lockheed Martin is taking it, buying it from us, and using it to train the US Army. So I'm going to show that solution here that we developed. This was 
made in india but just not made in india it was invented in india it was designed in india so i present to you hollow world metaverse uh, is the audio <laughs> So can we have the audio? So I think there is some audio issue, but I can take you through this. So you can see traditional classroom training, it's not intuitive. Biggest problem is so many soldiers die in training itself or get injured and disabled. Even in NCC, so many people get disabled, right? So what we have done is, we now have the universal simulator. What is the universal simulator? It is the hollow suit. It tracks all your body movements. Because everything that a soldier does, what is skill? Skill is what you do with your body. So by being able to capture all the body movements, by being able to virtualize the environment, by using the most advanced spatial AI engine to create PUBG in 3D in the real world. So you can see here, you can just use the interface to create all the terrains, we have created Jammu and Kashmir, Nadiyal, all the operations, all the terrains that the Indian Army needs, it's already been created. The soldiers are using hollow suit and augmented reality, virtual reality to now learn these things. Now, this was one application, right? But how do we actually train all of you? How do we train all of you in being able to do these things? So that's why I'm very happy to announce that we are partnering with Karnavati University, Hollow Suit and Karnavati University and Hollow World. We are bringing the world's largest, we are going to be making the world's largest design metaverse right here in Karnavati and military design metaverse. So what is this metaverse, right? So if you look at it, Microsoft owned Web 1.0. What was Web 1.0? It was all browsers. It was all 2D browser interactions, right? Web 2.0, most of you know WhatsApp. <laughs> WhatsApp, Facebook, Amazon, right? E-commerce and social media was Web 2.0. Now Web 3.0 is coming, which has what technologies? It has technologies to take you from this body into the virtual world and also take that virtual world and bring it to you. This is what means by augmented reality and virtual reality. If we take you into a world, if you take you into Himalayas, if you take you into the submarine, if you take you under the water or over the air, like you might have all heard about flight simulators, right? What does it do? It takes you to some place. That is virtual reality. There is one more reality called augmented reality, which is we bring everything in front of you. So you will see an example of this augmented reality. So here, I am showcasing how there are two robots. And this is what we will be working very closely with you. Could you tell me one of these robots is a real robot? which is actually placed. One of it is a virtual robot, completely designed and made virtually, digitally, as a replica. Now, how many of you think that the left one is the real robot? Raise your hands. How many of you think that the right one is the real robot? Raise your hands. Okay, so now let us see how many of you don't know. Can you raise your hands? <laughs> so, can we switch back to the video? So, if you see here, we are basically looking at these two things and how can you make out the difference? Which one is real, which one is virtual, right? We have developed technologies which can track your body and allow you to now interact with virtual robots and real robots in the same way. So as you can see, 
I can basically use just my hands to start interacting with the robot and teaching students about robots, not just making them bigger, smaller, we'll make them transparent, we'll take out the parts, we will do so many things. You'll see an example here where I think most of you experience the tractor demo, right? In the, if you have not, please come and visit us. We have the expo booth over there where we are teaching it. So the future of design is going to be like this, where see, you will not be able to make a difference between what is real and what is virtual. Because it is going to become more and more realistic. And that is what is the metaverse. That physical and digital. The digital is going to enter into physical. How? Through the glass and the glove. See, right now, Apple, HoloLens, Facebook, they are owning the glove. But we, in India, we, sorry, they are owning the glasses. Facebook, they're making those Quest glasses. Microsoft, they're making those HoloLens glasses, augmented reality. Apple is about to come out with their own glass, Apple glass. But I'm very happy to share that we in India, we are owning the gloves, holosuit gloves. Because gloves is the one which will allow you to interact with all these, right? See, the glass will only allow you to see. But what does the army need? It needs to go and do things. It is not just about knowledge. It is about action and dynamic action. You need to go and the terrorist will come at you. If the Indian army gets trained like this, then how many people we will be able to save by simulating all that information, right? We'll get knowledge as to how the soldiers got killed previously and we will train them the enemy AI, the terrorist AI will come and it will do the same things that we saw in our last battle with the terrorist. The Chinese, we will simulate the Chinese soldiers coming and hitting us in the exact same way that the soldiers are describing. The AI, the spatial AI is going to be so good. It is going to start teaching you on doing all these operations. So as you can see, this type of metaverse is going to completely change. I mean, how many of you are interested in working on this technology in partnership with us, building? Because we are looking at hiring a lot of interns and a lot of full-time people. Together, jointly, we will build a new metaverse. And what is this metaverse going to look like? So let me share with you what this new metaverse is going to look like. It is going to have a combination of various technologies. And it is not just going to be limited to military, right? I think as the previous kind of speaker told, the civil-military fusion is very critical. So every technology that we build, we are going to build it for various technology, various domains. So in sports domain, for example, you can be learning from Yuraj Singh. Yuraj Singh is our brand ambassador, right? So we can design like somebody to throw the ball in the same technology we take and we help the military throw grenades, teach them on how to throw the grenades. So we will analyze your body movements, teach you the best way in which you can throw the ball. And by using Holosuit, we can actually, and with your partnership, we can teach the military personnel how to throw the grenade. What is the best trajectory, right? And we will validate also. See, the hardest thing to do with knowledge, you can easily validate. You can ask questions. Skill, how will you validate whether somebody knows how to throw, whether to throw like this, whether to throw like this? Because we are going to actually put all the physics in the metaverse. So we are going to also put exoskeleton, which is going to prevent you. Let's say you hold something in the virtual world. Right now, if you hold this, nothing is preventing your hand. That is where we are designing the exoskeletons for the Indian military, which will simulate how your hands will stop, stop when you're holding a gun, how your kind of legs will stop. Let us say you're actually putting something on this virtual world. Your legs should not be able to go through it. Right now, that is not happening. That is why you're not getting a fully immersive experience. And we are building those core technologies and we will be deploying it together and putting it into our army, putting it into our air force, putting it into our navy, and then most importantly, 
exporting it worldwide. So that is where we can do this in sports. Similarly, we are building humanoid robots. So we have already exported the best humanoid robots to Ericsson, South America, which are controlled by the same holosuit, right? The humans can teach the robots. The robots can teach the humans. The robot can basically hold the bat and show you how you should bat, or it can hold the grenade and show you how to throw. And the humans can, the trainers, the master trainers, can basically train the robots. So in military, there are these highly skilled people who are the best trainers, but they don't have the time, they don't have the space, right? We are eliminating that time and space barrier. So by eliminating the time and space barrier, one person sitting can design the best of the courses, the best of the training, and billions can actually be using the same thing and learning. We can also train the trainers using this technology. So the advantages of this are so good that the cost. See, why are we not able to build all these things which the developed nations are building? The biggest problem is cost. We can't afford to equip all our labs, all our kind of facilities with the latest materials. It costs too much. And the second thing is, it one is cost of material, the other is cost of people. The best of the people have already gone abroad. It is, we are trying to bring them here, but still, they may not want to come physically. But using this metaverse, we will bring them here virtually and have them teach in this same metaverse. We are humans and robots. That's why we are calling this is the skill metaverse for augmenting humans and robots. We will bring in the humans, we will bring in the robots, connect them together, and there, how will we pay these humans? That's where NFT, blockchain, everything will come. You come and design a beautiful sword, the Game of Thrones sword, in the virtual world using hollow suit. You use the same processes and create a sword and put it up for sale in the metaverse and somebody will buy it. Similarly, you can have somebody come and design the best course from anywhere in the world, in anything, in this metaverse, and somebody will pay you. How will they pay you? Using blockchain technology, hollow buck, right? So we have a currency for this where they can pay you also. And the best part is some student maybe in 12th standard, he doesn't have any money. He can teach somebody in 10th standard something on this metaverse, earn the money, and then he can go and maybe he wants to learn tennis or he wants to kind of get a year's force simulation. So he can basically like teach somebody, earn some credits, and then transfer those credits in this metaverse and earn something else, right? So we are creating what Facebook did for social media, for entertainment. We are going to be doing it for skilling. So that is why it is called the skill metaverse. And if we own this technology in terms of gaming, in terms of industrial training, in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, in terms of entertainment, tactical training, I mean, various applications are there. Indian Air Force, we can show them this is the hollow projection technology, which here itself in 3D, it will recreate completely the, I was telling about Raphael. Imagine you being able to see the Raphael and actually dry the Raphael and have physical and digital simulations of the Raphael. Because only digital simulations are passe. They are 20, 30 years old technology. Now we need digital simulations, part physical, part digital. That's where exoskeleton comes in. That's where hollow suit comes in. That's where the glass and the glove concept comes in. That's where hollow projector comes in, which is again a made in India, patented in India technology, exported worldwide. Same thing with hollow capture. Same thing with hollow entra robots. Same thing with this extended reality, hollow extended reality. So we have this complete domain and all I want to do is end this with the note that possibilities are endless. And so is our potential. So let us make sure that your potential reaches the maximum. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you so much.
Harsha sir, that was amazing. I am a mother to an eight-year-old, and the eight-year-old talks about the metaverse and space, and I am still learning. So this has been an amazing thing. I know there are questions because this has been one session that a lot of students have been waiting for. But we are running short on time, so is there any way you can maybe, you are on Instagram, are you some place? Yes, I am on Twitter. So I am on Twitter and on this thing. So you can, I have a personal Twitter called K and Harsha. At, um, so that is my Twitter handle, K for King, N for Nancy, H-A-R-S-H-A. -H -A. You can also reach out to hollow world underscore one, H-O-L-O. W-O-R-L-D underscore one, that is our Twitter handle. And of course, we have our website also, hollowworld.one. So you're most welcome to reach out, learn more. Anyway, the best part is we are going to be working very closely together on bringing these things. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Asha. Sir, without further delay, I'd like to call Somitra Vaidya, Assistant Director, to kindly deliver the word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Priti ji. OK. Uh, it was truly a great experience, and uh, I just thought of Howard Stark and Tony Stark sharing their experiences. I just re recalled Iron Man movie, and I could see it in reality. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It was indeed been a joy and privilege to have you here and share with uh, us the fantastic innovations and the knowledge in uh, Holosuit with AR and VR technologies. Uh, it was truly an eye-opening and entire world together where innovation can happen. Thank you once again, sir, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Samitra, sir, and thanks you, thank you once again. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a huge round of applause to um, Harsha, sir, and without any further delay, I'd like to invite the next speaker, who is Lieutenant General B.S. Jaswal, PVSM, and bar to AVSM, VSM, retired. Could we kindly have him on stage as the team sets up uh, for the next speaker? Sir, could we kindly have you on stage? Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Lieutenant General B.S. Jaswal, sir. Um, I'd request K.K. Singh, sir, Director, Academic Administration, UID. Sorry, K.K., sir, A.K. second, huh? we're just... Uh... Jaswal, sir. Uh, just also, a key second. Uh, I request KK Singh, sir, Director, Academic Administration, UID, to kindly welcome him with a stole and a veena. Jaswal, sir, is a man of action. He's already there at the mic and refusing to. <laughs> a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, KK, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a proud privilege for me to be sharing my thoughts with galaxy of intellectuals and, of course, the future of India, the students who are sitting behind. Now, there's a caveat put on me that I was supposed to speak for 45 minutes, but uh, Due to constraints, I think uh, the hungry stomach also, I have to speak now for 30 minutes, that's fine. Okay, now anyway, I'm in control, so <laughs> but I will finish him. Uh, we had a very famous field marshal, Sam Manakshaw, very humorous person. After retirement, I was, uh, Lucky to see him deliver a talk to the cadets at the IMA when I was an instructor there as a major. So he had come there on leadership. In the evening, we were having cocktails. And so we asked him, sir, how are you leading your life? 
He says, well, it's all good. Uh, but the only bad thing is my wife goes and sleeps in a different bedroom. So we said, uh, well, well, sir. He said, no, 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 because probably I snore. So we said, well, sir, well, sir. He said, no, 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 no. The day I want her to come to be in my room, I tell her ghost stories. So today I will try and tell you some ghost stories so that we remain on the same page. Uh, the ghost story, the topic which I'm going to be talking is paradigm shift in the philosophy of defense production in India. Now, the ecosystem of defense production in any country depends as to how exactly the threat due to the ambivalent geostrategic canvas which is developing and analysis of that. It also depends on the state of economy and your capacity and capability. Now, to improve your capacity and capability, while well, we are adopting this Atman Nirbhar, osmosis in the form of revolutionary military affairs and transformational strategies, they should become the rubric of our endeavor. Uh, I feel fortunately we have crossed the Rubicon of our old mindset and now we have graduated on to Atmanirbhar. Uh, we have to ride the chariots of excellence. We have the will now in the country and I'm sanguine that we will touch the holy grail of becoming a powerful nation. Now, what all I'll be talking today? Firstly, I will just give you a mosaic of the threat analysis, futuristic threat analysis, because that will make my your mind working as to what all our forces require subsequently. And that's itself the second part of it. How exactly the employment of our forces is going to take place in this futuristic threat environment. Then I'm going to talk about the scan of global defense expenditure because we have shortage of funds always. Then what exactly is this philosophy of uh, Atman Nirbhar and some positive steps which have been taken for indigenization. Now what exactly is the manifestation of futuristic threat scenario? I'll be brief because it is a lecture in itself, but I'll just touch some bullet points on that. The futuristic war scenario will entail short duration war. It is going to be lethal and intense with few skirmishes. The focus is different with Pakistan, it's different with China. But basically, it may not be spatial gains, that is to capture territory alone. In the case of Pakistan, it will be to remove our vulnerabilities and create criticalities. But with China, it's a different cup of tea because he believes that we should win, we means him, all without fighting. Now, this philosophy, this manifests, manifests into customized war, hybrid warfare, gray zone warfare, and uh, there is also a designer warfare. Yesterday I had spoken about it, but I like to repeat it, which is currently happening in a country. Designer warfare is you make the enemy fight with its own internal infirmities and inadequacies, which you create. And this is what exactly is happening on the political front, on the religious front. 
all being induced. So that's another threat. What you can do as incubators, well, I'll leave it to you. The war is going to be concurrent at multiple acupuncture points. It's going to be on land, sea, air, space, EMP, uh, cyber attack, etc. Now all this, we, from this we can extrapolate that if this is the kind of warfare, we have to transform our systems and soldiers into a smart soldier system. So that is where you all come in, into play. Real-time surveillance is going to be very important. I'll use the cyber term, intrusion, detection and intrusion prevention. Intrusion, I would also include the intent of him to intrude. Uh, we would require a potent think tank, which will be uh, constantly analyzing the threat manifestations. Uh, I said yesterday also, uh, think tanks are there, but the prophecies, what has been the experience, they go defunct by this very think tank. But nevertheless, some of them come true. And as the face of warfare is changing, uh, prophecies will have to be analyzed in a different manner. Now this kind of war which is there, this is all time related. You may have war, you may not have war. But one thing for sure is there. The presence of insurgency in our country because Pakistan is pursuing it, so is China pursuing it. In Pashto, there is a saying, kam kharch bala nishin, implying minimum investment and maximum dividends. Now, insurgency is such a tool. So we have to see that this particular facet is addressed. Who is more important in insurgency? The infantry soldier. So you cannot offset the role of an infantry soldier in a technological bubble of war. He is the ultimate on ground and we must focus. That's where you all come into play. Now, uh, employment for forces otherwise, slight expansion. War is, it's on, it's in, in, on the wall, writing on the wall, that we are going to face a two and a half front war. Uh, nuclear weapons, now, much is being spoken on nuclear weapons. I have a different personal viewpoint and I've discussed with intellectuals, some have agreed, some have not. You see, as far as nuclear warfare in our context is concerned, it is just a deterrent. It may not take place because of the inherent factor in it, assured mutual destruction. Musharraf had the guts to say that the moment an Indian boot crosses Pakistan territory, I will nuke. In response, General Padman Aban was addressing us while I was doing the NDC course. He said, a nuclear tactical attack, that is Hataf 9 of theirs, 70 kilometers range, one kilometer radius, it's a nuclear attack. Our response will be nuclear prohibitive and nine to 10 cities of Pakistan will be just obliterated. You mean to say that Musharraf would have ever taken such a step? No way. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of uh, just a deterrent in our case, but in the Western world, in their lexicon, nuclear weapons, tactical weapons are part of the conventional warfare. Uh, what we call peace and war, the dividing line is, oh, I have to close within five minutes, so I'll not be able to finish the entire thing. So I, I don't know whether I should speak about the futuristic, uh, uh, okay, I'll skip pages, there's no problem. Adjustment. 
I'll come straight to the submission then. I had a lot to speak. How exactly the budgetary support, etc., is being given. But I'll just sum it up. Uh, I think just five minutes a day. I just got the slip. One, the threat is omnipresent. Therefore, our capability to respond should be omnipresent and you all are going to form that base of production of new products and making India self-sufficient and self-reliant. Whereas the desirability is there, the feasibility is not there because of our capacity and capability constrained by the budget this is going to definitely improve because now everything that we manufacture, uh, that's going to be 68% of capital procurement is going to be procured in India at a lesser cost. So we would be able to offset the feasibility part of it, which was there. Uh, but I would like to caution here that don't, be, uh, don't get away with the idea that there will be no imports. There will be imports where niche technology is there. Otherwise, we are going to be increasing our FDI and we, uh, that has been increased from 49 to 74% now. And the company will be Indian owned. It will be made in India. And we have already told uh, US, France, Russia and Israel Hereafter, our imports from you is uh, going to be on made in India basis. We are also going to look into export oriented uh, manufacturing. Block 2016-19, the exports rose from 2,000 crores to 9,000 crores. That is the potential and we would be going ahead with it. We have the niche domain of brain in our country and skill mass that is going to be exploited as part of uh, your Atma Nirbhar. Uh, formulation of sound policies for budgetary support, which is being done by the IDEX with the Technical Development Fund. Uh, there's so many organizations. I would have given the flow chart, but uh, there's no time. Uh, and exploiting our uh, vectors like the DRDO, their technology which they have, this will all go in improving things as far as uh, Atmanirbhar is concerned. One thing very good is infusion of MSMEs. This will give a lot of Philip to startups. And this is where you are going to be designing small, small things. Today, India stands second in the world for startups. And you are going to be the base for all these startups, especially in the MSME realm. Uh, gentlemen, I would conclude by saying, we are capable, we have the will, and we shall dare to dream to make a country powerful by adopting Atna Nirbhar. My apologies, I had to cut short my pages, and uh, I think I don't want the stomach to be agonized anymore. You are looking for lunch. Thank you so much. If anyone has any question, you can ask me or later on, whatever it is. Thank you so much, uh, Jaswal, sir. I'd now like to call Sambit uh, Pradhan, Assistant Professor of UID, to deliver the word of thanks. Uh, yes, there is a question from Mr. Kakkar.
चल रहा है think tank which the government takes seriously about what the future is going to be and not in reaction to what somebody has done for instance like look the drone business today has suddenly sprouted wings because jammu airport was attacked by a drone and because jammu airport was attacked by a drone everybody started running around trying to find anti drone possibilities and imported something for 2 crores from israel before that everybody was talking about anti drone facilities nobody is bothered so do we induce the kick in the ass or do we wait for somebody else to kick us in the ass i uh, i'm so glad mr kakkar you brought up this question if you see my pages i have exactly written what you have said uh the analysis of threat manifestation is a continuous process point 2 we have to be proactive we cannot work on the current threat analysis and there has to be scenario building approach which has to be taken so that what can happen in the future what kind of weapon we have to require this exactly happened in ladakh when the situation took place we didn't have the stores we have to buy at a prohibitive cost today if you go over here there is technology which is available in the uh, in the exhibition where they can produce had we got the stocks these people would have been there had we got the weapon systems which like uh, mr bharat kalyani uh, bharat forge kalyani uh, he is producing a uh, bofor gun equivalent vajra i mean we have everything but what mr kakkar said we react so this is already i wanted to touch this we react second is the ease of business what you talking very important and under the atmanirbhar scheme uh, what the prime minister has said there is going to be single window clearances and there is going to be budgetary support for those startups and msmes who can never dream to produce because of lack of budget so they are taking this step i assure you and i'm sure what is there um, is truth you know mr kalyani has been working on the gun for the last 7 years without any government support without any impetus because he thought it was necessary to do it uh, i couldn't get that like I mr said, kalyani I at bharat forge in pune has been developing the gun for the last 7 years without any support or any effort from anybody else except himself yeah i i i i couldn't have agreed more uh, baba kalyani is uh, i am rather from his school and i keep interacting with him what he has said is i have no reservations in sharing he wanted to make a tank barrel for india which we are importing from russia he wanted some metallurgy from a condemned gun which didn't go to him no support was there you are absolutely right i am aware of i don't want to speak much on it but you are totally right but there is a paradigm shift now as far as our approach is there yeah i cross my fingers and toes also that this will fructify in letter and spirit but this is what it is it's a very good question and uh, uh, very thought provoking it's long and i'm so happy because i had included all these points in my script yeah anyone else thank you sabit over to you for the word of thanks so uh, uh, sir i appreciate very much that you are admitting that the threat and threat threat directed strategization of our defense uh, is quite misplaced Uh, to me it seems that uh, defense is all about thinking 30 years 40 years and looking at how the capture of strategic resources that is what the usa does that is what the Rus russia does that is what china does we unfortunately do what whatever we want to do vis-a-vis pakistan vis-a-vis china and end up not really you know 
in, in a really strategic position while we aim for it, we vocalize it, but we don't work for it. I, I couldn't have agreed more. Uh, I've had uh, the privilege of serving in the Army headquarters, and I was uh, for a while uh, in MI8, which deals with insurgency in the North. As part of it, I used to be interacting with the PP directorate, perspective plan directives. Our plans, what you're saying, were not that much in depth. The Army is the one which has got the maximum insight as far as perspective plans are concerned. Let me tell you, assure you, as far as the defense is concerned. But when you say that this prophecy, I'll call not the word perspective, prophecy is going to work, uh, we don't cater for what could be the other prophecies, sub-prophecies, which may be there, which may turn the entire thing. India and China, they were in such good bonhomie when the president came here, I think to Ahmedabad, Gandhinagar itself. We could never imagine what was going to happen. So the prophecies which were being built was being built on bonhomie. We forgot, China says, Hindi chini bhai bhai, or as Sunzu said, and this is exactly what has happened, I'll quote. I'm very fond of China because I've read a lot. I've been there, my passport was canceled by China when as the Northern Army commander. So I read China quite a bit. Chinese believe, hold a dagger behind your cloak. Make the enemy smile. Disarm him with your smile so that he lowers his weapon, guard. Once he is disarmed, stab him. He did that in 62. He did it now also. So you are 200% right. I think the think tank, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't cover the whole thing. Uh, everything is mentioned in my script. That the prophecies have to be re-prophesized. It is not, uh, you know, uh, 20 years hence, this is going to happen. What are the midway check, check on it? What is the expertise of the think tank? Is it only military? Is it political military? Is it economic also? The, all the think tank is not an individual opinion. It has to be a cumulative effect. So this, I totally agree with you. Thank you so much for highlighting. General P.S. Jaswal, it has been an exhilarating honor to have been witness to your arresting and lucid oration. Thank you so much for sharing with us your invaluable experience, insight, and wisdom. It is indeed a true inspiration. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sambit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. We take a lunch break, ladies and gentlemen. I'm seeing you in 30 minutes for the next session. Students, 30 minutes means 30 minutes. I hope to see you all quickly. It's quick lunch, and I'm looking forward to seeing each one of you. Thank